Genesis chapter 50, Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. If you have a Bible, you could turn. If you don't have a Bible, make sure to grab one on your way out the door. There are free Bibles. Well, I say they're free, but you already paid them for them with your tithes and offerings. So now they're free. So go ahead and grab your Bible on the way out the door. It's on the house. And I know some of y'all read the Bible on your phone. There ain't nothing wrong with that, but there's something about having a physical Bible that comes. Anybody in the room, we got a real Bible. Ain't no iPhone or Android. Let me, no, I want to see your hand. I want to see your Bible. Let me, let me, I don't, I don't believe you. If it Thank you. If it ain't in the room, I, I got a Bible. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I want to see it in your, come on now, that's the woman of God right there. Get you a Bible on the way out. Color in that thing. Draw in it. Dog ear it. Here's what they say. Old folks used to say this. If your Bible is falling apart, your life probably is not. Come on now. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I heard Pastor Brian be ending services on time and stuff, so I got to behave. I got to... I'm the senior pastor, though. I don't have to do nothing. Here we go. Genesis chapter 50 for 15. It says this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. By the way, if you think you were raised in a dysfunctional family, just read the Bible. There is no more dis. Man, my brothers beat me up when I was growing. At least they didn't sell you into slavery, okay? You are doing better than Joseph was. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying thus, you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. Let me just pause for context. They were lying, y'all. When their dad died, he didn't say anything, but they knew they would probably be in trouble, so they're making up lies at the end to try to save their tale. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be scurred. I'm sorry. I'm from Baltimore. I forget I'm in Charlotte. Y'all proper down here. Do not be afraid, <laughs> for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for. That's the message we ain't got to preach. The evil you've been through, God's going to turn it around for your good. Some of us have been through seasons and situations that we would not wish on our worst enemy. And though the enemy tried to take you out, God said, don't you worry. I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. It will work out for your good. And if it ain't good... God's not done working yet. God turned this evil for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Father God, we're grateful, we're thankful for, for this move of God that is Union Church. We're grateful for the hundreds of lives that have given their life to you, Jesus. We're grateful for this moment because you're here. God, because you're here, healing is here, purpose is here, freedom is here. All we stand in need of is in this place right now. So, God, we pray that you'd speak. As you speak, we will listen and we'll be ever so careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, shout amen and amen and amen. I, uh, I am a, a, a movie buff. I, uh, I just love watching movies. Now, I know you get around certain people, and they're like, wealthy people don't watch movies. Movies are what people who, who don't have responsibility. We, we're supposed to be reading books and educating ourselves. And yeah, whatever. Life is stressful. It is overwhelming, all that I do. And I just need one moment where I can sit in front of a TV and don't have to fix nobody else's problems. Anybody you just, I could just do with a good moment movie just uh, and and but when, when I say I like move what I, I, I like good movies because not all movies are good movies I, I don't do that romantic foolishness I ain't got time for that we 
We know the story. He breaks our heart. They go their separate ways. They come back at the end. It all works out. I, 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 you're going to judge me as a pastor. I don't like movies where everybody lives to the end. I need, I, I need somebody dead in the first five minutes. I, I need spies. I need espionage. I need pillaging. I need, I need murder. I know that's not really like godly or whatever. I need, and I, I sit and I watch a movie, and I'm like, I, I just, I want to, who's not going to make it? Who's like, and, and you, I, I even kind of read through the actors and see what they paid each person. And I'm like, based on what they paid you, you ain't going to make it to the end. They, they, that, that salary is that you're only going to be here for the first 15. But w w one of the things I've discovered, and you discovered the same thing, not all movies are great movies. Uh, I don't know if we're on the internet. I'm gonna I don't know if y'all saw John Wick yet. I ain't gonna spoil it, but it wasn't a great movie. It wasn't. It was. It, it was. It was. Uh, go see it. Go see it. Go see it. It was great, but it's just. It's. It, you had three weeks, okay? It ain't on me. That's only. It's. It was. It was average. The the difference between a movie, a good movie, and and a great movie, is, is the script writer. A great script writer will make sure there's something in the movie that you don't see coming. If you walk out of the movie at the end and it went exactly the way you thought it was gonna go, it wasn't, it was Rocky. It wasn't a good movie. It, Adrian, we know. You get beat up for seven rounds and you come back and you win. That's not a good, I, I, a great, for example, this is like 10 years old. You ever seen, and I know I'm dating myself, but Batman, Batman, what is it, Batman Rises. If you ain't seen it, you've had 10 years, so spoiler alert. <laughs> but it's a typical Batman, and the villain in this movie is a guy by the name of Bane. And Bane was kidnapped and thrown into this prison that wasn't a normal prison. It was like this pit in the ground that nobody could climb out of. And Bane spent his whole life trying to climb out of this pit. And after years and years of being tortured and all this, he climbs out of this pit. He, he, he rescues this little girl with him. And then he takes the rest of his life to make everybody pay for the pit that he came up out of. <laughs> That's not what Joseph did, but it's what Bane did and, and Batman. And, and at the end of the movie, here it is, Batman battling Bane. They're going back at it. And what you don't see coming is that little girl that Bane rescued turned out to be the villain of the whole movie. Bane was just her puppet. And here's Batman focused on one enemy. That little girl comes up behind Batman. <laughs> He's, it was, sorry, this is <laughs> TMI, TMI, I'm sorry. Batman leaking, it was glorious. <laughs> but you didn't see it coming. And you walk out of that movie saying, wow, ha, that was good. Here's what you have to understand, that God is the ultimate script writer. The Bible actually says that before you were formed in your mother's womb, that he was writing out, he was ordering your steps. The Bible says in Acts that he picked the exact city, the time in history, the family that you would be born into so that you would have the greatest chance, A, of knowing who he is, but also living a life that's above and beyond all that you can ever ask, think, or imagine. Somebody shout, God is writing my story. And because God is writing your story and he is the ultimate script writer and the great script writers always have something that you don't see coming, you've got to understand there's a part to your story that God is writing that you don't see coming. There's so many people that wake up on a Monday thinking it's going to be like last Monday. And they step into 2023 thinking it's going to be like 2022. And, and without even realizing it, we go through life with no faith. With no expectation that God is going to do something that we don't see. If I were to ask you, what is God currently doing in your life? What, what's he working on? What's he up to? What is God setting you up for? If I were to ask a lot of people, their answer would be like, uh, God's good. Oh, no, you, 
your story. So what, what is he doing in your life? I'm not, I'm not sure. Hear me. While God is a great script writer, and he does unexpected things in our lives, God is not a God who likes surprises. God is not a God that likes to catch you off guard. Watch this. He actually wants to tell you what he's going to do in your life before he does it. But we've got to be paying attention. The Bible says this in Amos chapter 3, verse 7. It says, surely the Lord God does, what's that word? Nothing. nothing. There, there, there's nothing that God does unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Somebody say, that's me, that's me, that's me. That's, God says, I'm doing something great in Charlotte. I'm doing something great in your family. I'm doing something great in your life, and I want to tell you what I am doing. I, I have three thoughts. I'm not going to take too long, about three more hours to preach this message, but just three quick thoughts of, of what God is always doing in your life. Write this down. The first thought is this. God is always working on my next blessing. God is always. Y'all missed the place to shout amen, which means y'all. <laughs> Come on, look at somebody next to you. Say, God's working on your next blessing. Come on, tell somebody. God, 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 is, God is working on your next promotion. He's working on your next door opening. He's working on your next healing. He's working on your, I didn't see this coming, God. I don't deserve this. I didn't know this was going to happen. God is working on your next blessing. The Bible says in Deuteronomy Chapter 28, verse 3, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You shall be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. And if you grew up on Fred Hammond like I did, you know the rest of it. I mean, say, say, bless. I don't sing. Stop, stop. This ain't Pastor Brian. This ain't, that's next week. That ain't this week. God is always working on your next blessing. The problem is it doesn't look that way. The Bible says, talking about Joseph, that, that Joseph had a dream. And I don't know if you're familiar with this story. God came to Joseph, and Joseph had a dream. And basically the dream that Joseph had is that his 11 brothers, his mother and his father, were going to bow down and worship him. That's a really good dream. I, I like that dream. I tell my siblings that dream all the time. One day you people are going to. But can, can I give you some advice? If, if God tells you that, that you're going to employ your siblings, that you're going to be their boss, that they're going to worship you one day, don't tell them. Let God tell him, okay? Let God, let, he, he can speak for himself. Joseph, no. He went and told his siblings, y'all going to work for me one day. I'm going to be your boss. You're going to worship me. And, and they threw his tail in prison. They said, oh, bet they took. By the way, talking about dysfunctional families, they got together, they threw him in a pit, and they said, let's kill him. And then Judah, who was the Christian among the bunch, said, hey, guys, we can't kill him. We're Christians. Let's sell him into slavery. Because that's so much better than murder. So they take him, they sell him into slavery. He ends up being a slave in, in, in a house, and he's working. And, and while he's there, he has a promise from God. But nothing about his situation looks like what God told him it's going to be. He ends up in this house, and the, the woman of the house actually charges him with assault, even though he did nothing to her. And he gets thrown in a prison off of something that he never did, and now he finds himself lost. You ever been in a situation where you prayed for one thing, and as soon as you started praying, it's like life started tracking the opposite direction. And things were bad at first, but then I prayed, and it got worse and worse and worse. What is going on? You've got to understand that the ultimate scriptwriter is working on your next blessing. Maybe you find yourself feeling invisible. Nobody knows me. Nobody's seen me. I, I, I'm not being noticed by anything. The doors are getting slammed. This is not working out why, the way I thought it would be. Just because you feel invisible does not mean God is not working on your behalf. Watch this. When Joseph finally got out of prison, 
It's because Pharaoh, the most powerful nation in the world at the time was Egypt. Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the planet, had a dream that nobody else could interpret. And they finally remembered, hey, there's this Jew in prison. His name is Joseph. He can interpret dreams. Let's go get him. Watch this. When Joseph was thrown into prison three years prior, Pharaoh had no dream. And if they had called for Joseph when there was no problem for Joseph to solve, there would have been no need for Joseph. God said, I need you to stay there. Because I'm preparing the blessing for Joseph, you're not the problem. The blessing is the problem. The blessing ain't quite ready yet. The, bless, the blessing isn't quite prepared yet. And, yeah, but any, any, any Caribbean folks in the room? Any Caribbean folks? Come on now. My, my whole family's from the island of Barbados. We, 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 we do that. We, no offense if you're not Caribbean, but you just never lived before unless you get around Americans. You're like, oh, it's Thanksgiving. We had we got turkey. <laughs> Y'all eat that stuff? <laughs> Y'all got your, your seven cheese, mac and cheese. Now, nah, you ain't lived until you had oxtail and peas and rice and, and jerk chicken and beef patty. That's the Holy Spirit just rests and hovers. <laughs> anyway, if you're cribbing, you've had a mango. If you ever had a mango before, maybe you're not cribbing. You had one of the Mexican mangoes that they have the store. You would need a Haitian mango, by the way. But anyway. Mango is the best fruit on planet Earth. By the way, that's what Eve ate to ruin the world. It wasn't, it wasn't an apple, because nobody's ever ruined the world off of an apple. It was a mango. <laughs> Sweetest fruit you will ever have in your life, if it's ripe. Wait for it. But if you eat a mango before it's ripe, it will be the most bitter, disgusting, hard thing you've ever experienced. The exact same fruit that's about to be sweet about four weeks later, you just got it prematurely, and a blessing prematurely is not a blessing at all. Some of us are... Not you, just me. I get in these spaces where I go, God, why me? I didn't deserve this. It should have changed by now. I, this should have worked out by now. I should have had my kid by now or been married by now or business should have taken off. And God is saying, if you would just wait just a moment, I'm working on a blessing that is above and beyond anything that you could ever ask, think, or imagine. The issue is not you. The issue is I'm working on your next blessing. It's easier to preach than it is to live. I became the senior pastor of what is now Union Church back in 2011. My dad, can you honor my father, the founding pastor of Union Church on the front row? But I became the senior pastor in 2011 in September. We launched as a brand new. We didn't have a launch like y'all had. Y'all had thousands of people walk through the door first day. We weren't on that level. We had like 300 people. And I was so excited and happy for my 300 people. 27 people gave their life to Jesus. And seven weeks later, we had 70 people in the church. I said, we're going to be the fastest <laughs> closing church <laughs> in the history of America at this rate. We'll be closed by Christmas. I'm like, God, why have you forsaken me? After the first year, we had 150. Second year, 250. Third, and was just growing, just slow. Y'all got more people on your dream team in week 12 <laughs> than we had in our entire church four years. In. And I'm feeling completely... God, this is not what you promised. This is not what I saw. God, this is not what we prayed for, fasted for, gave. Not any clue that fast forward just what eight years later, I'd be sitting in a different city in front of thousands of people that say, hey, we're a part of what God. Just because you feel invisible right now does not mean that God is not working on your next blessing. God, God. When you feel invisible, God's working. When, when, when times are hard, understand it's God working on your next blessing. I, I got to be very careful with this because I got to get your theolog theology correct. God does not bring hard times into your life. God, God, God doesn't bring curses. He doesn't bring problems. Bring, but he uses them. He said, Since you're going through a storm, let me use it for your good. For example, you ever heard of Job? Job, Job, Job. If you ever have a bad day, read the book of Job. 
And that's what I do. It encourages me because I realize my life is bad, but it ain't that bad because that's really jacked up. Jo Job was the most godly person on the earth. Jo Job had more wealth, had, had beautiful children, and, and Satan was in God's presence. You could preach that to yourself because that's confusing and I don't know what. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Satan said, the only reason why Job worships you is because he has all that stuff. God said, fine, you can take his stuff, just don't touch him. So Job lost all of his children. They all passed away, all of his wealth, everything. He took everything but his one bitter wife. And why couldn't they take in the wife? It just, <laughs> I know y'all got out of relationship series, so I ain't going to go there. But God, you could have took her too. Anyway. <laughs> and what a lot of people miss is in that hardship, God was setting Job up for a blessing. At the end of the book, the Bible said God gave Job twice as much as everything he lost. But here's the problem. At the beginning of the book, Job had pride in his heart. Job said, your heart, God said, Job, your heart is not to the place where you can receive all that I have for you. So even in this hard season where it looks like I've abandoned you, I haven't abandoned you. I'm working on you. Read the book of Job. Job said dumb stuff like, I've never sinned before. I am right. I just, Job thought he did not need God. And God said, if I bless somebody who thinks they don't need me, that blessing will turn into a curse. Let me work on their heart in this season so they can be in the right place to receive all that I have for them. You may be going through a hardship saying, why me? I don't deserve this. God has forgotten about me. Hear me. God is working on your heart, setting you up for the blessing that he has next for you. Our church grew to 400 people, and it stalled out for three years. You know how discouraging it is where you preach every Sunday and not one person adds to the church? I preached the best message of my life. 20 people get saved, 20 people get mad at me and leave the church. Same number. Next week, I preached the worst message of my life. 10 people leave, 10 people come because they felt bad for me. It didn't matter what I did. It, would, it got so bad, y'all, that I tried to give the church away. I was like, maybe this is not what God's called me to do. Maybe I'm in over my head. I went to the big church in town and said, hey, can we be one of your campuses? Y'all, they said no. You know you got a bad church when you can't even give it away. That's when you know. That's when God's left you, okay? That's what. Here's what I learned in hindsight. God says, Stephen, I'm going to do something great through you. But first I got to do it in you. Before I can do something, Stephen, I got to get you over you. Steve, Stephen, your confidence is not based in my presence. Your confidence is based in your skill. And if your confidence is based in your skill, you will fail. I've got to break you down so I can build you back up, that you can realize that it's Christ, the solid rock on which you stand. Maybe you're going through a sickness, a relational issue, or whatever it may be. God's going to heal this sickness. He's going to fix the relationship. He's going to open the door in the business. But don't miss the work that he is doing in your heart in that moment, saying, I've got to get you back to the place where you really realize that I am all that you need. Because when you realize that, you'll be able to steward. The, God is working on your next blessing when you feel invisible. He's working on your next blessing when you're going through a hardship. God's even working on your next blessing when you're already blessed. You've got to understand, when you've had the best season of your life, God is trying to see how you're stewarding his blessings to see if he can trust you with what he has next. You, you ever heard of Abraham? Abraham? Abraham, the Bible said he had outrageous wealth. He, he was influential. The Bible calls him the father of faith. He just did not have a son. If you look at Genesis chapter 14, Abraham's nephew, somebody say nephew. We're going somewhere. This is, this is the script writing, by the way. Don't miss this. Abraham's brother's son. Abraham didn't have a son, but his brother had a son. His brother passed away, so Abraham was taking care of somebody else's son. And Lot, Lot I don't have a lot of time to give you this, but Lot ended up getting kidnapped because he did what a lot of Christians do. Lot said, how close to sin can I get without falling in? God says, here's the city that has turned their back on me. Lot said, I ain't going to go to the club. I'm just going to stand outside and, and evangelize. I just, <laughs> I'm just here to hand out invite cards. Hey, hey, baby girl, how you doing? Come to church. 
Lot was on the edge and ended up getting kidnapped. And when Abraham finds out, he takes all of his servants and all of his son, all, all, you know, sons, but servants and employees, they put their armor on. They go out and fight and rescue somebody else's son. So we say Genesis 14. Genesis 15, after the battle, God steps into Abraham's tent and he says, come outside. Let me show you the stars. You're going to have so many children that you will not even be able to count your kids just like you can't count these stars. Abraham, I'm going to turn you into a great nation. Watch this. Genesis 14, Abraham's taking care of somebody else's son. Genesis 15, God says, you passed the test, now I can give you your own son. In seasons of blessing, God is looking to see, are you going to use it all for yourself? Are you going to be just focused on you? Or are you going to say, God has given me more than I need. Let me see who else I can be a blessing to. And in your abundance, if you'll focus on other people, God says, that's what I was waiting for. Now I can give you what you really desire. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. God is always working on your next blessing. Second thing is this. Write this down. Write this down. God is always working on using me. He, he's not just working on your next blessing. God is always working on using me. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says this. But as for you, you meant evil against me. Here's Joseph talking to his brothers. He's like, y'all try to kill me, man. But God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. So Joseph goes from a pit to, Pot to Potiphar's house, from Potiphar's house to a prison. From prison, he goes and interprets a dream. Here's what the dream was. The dream was that they were going to have seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. And Joseph told Pharaoh, if you would save in the seven years of abundance, you will not starve to death in the seven years of famine. Well, they listened to Joseph's advice, and Egypt actually became the only nation on the planet that had food. So every nation around them began to come in and buy and barter and trade just to live. Here's Joseph sitting in prison saying, this is not fair. I don't deserve. This is not what God called me to. And God is saying, Joseph, I'm working on something that's not just going to fulfill the dream that I've given you, but it is going to save nations around you. People that would have died if you were not in the right place at the right time are going to live because of where I put you. Hear me. It is immature Christianity to only see life through the lens of how does it affect me. If all you see out of life is how do I feel and where do I go and what is God doing for me, hear me, you've only started this Christian journey. When you get to a place of maturity, you realize God loves me, God is blessing me, God is for me, not against me, but it's not all about me. God is looking to use me to be a blessing to other people. You guys know David? The young boy who, who killed Goliath. David's battle against the giant wasn't the first fight in his life. So you read out, you find out that David was a shepherd out in the fields. And as he was a shepherd out in the field, a lion came. Tried to take one of his sheep. And, and David said, well, that's my dad's sheep. My dad's going to whoop my tail if I lose his sheep. And I prefer to fight a lion than my dad. So I'm going after that lion. And David killed the lion with his bare hands. And then a few months or years later, then a bear came. And, and David killed the bear. How do I know that God is preparing me for something when, when catastrophe happens over and over and over again? If it's one thing, you can just call it life. But if it's this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing, just hear me. You're in boot camp. God is trying to get your weight up. God, God's trying to teach you how to fight. Y'all going to send me back to Maryland. We, we just we got some soft Christians. We got some people that have believed a lie that when I give my life to Jesus, that means everything in my life is supposed to work out perfectly after that. And that's not what the Bible said. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. And you got to get a little bit of tenacity in you. You got to get a little bit of fight in you. You got to get a little bit of bounce back. Like Job said, though he slay me, yet will I bless him and worship. I'm so... 
Life is good. I'm in church. I lose my job. I ain't going because I don't feel like worshiping. That's when you need to go. When things aren't working, God, my blessing and my worship of you is not based on my circumstance. It's based on that you are good in my life. So look at some of these. Get your weight up. Get your weight up. Get your, get your weight up. Get your, listen, I, go through some situations where all you can do is cry. When you're done crying, stand up, walk out that door and say, God, I trust you. I believe you. You are working on something on my behalf. And watch this. When there's a giant named Goliath who's getting ready to destroy an entire nation, and nobody wants to fight that giant. Here comes David saying, I ain't scared. Why am I not scared? Because I've been through some fights before. I defeated a lion. I defeated a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, that's a biblical cuss word, by the way, is going to get the same as they did. God is looking for some believers that saying, this ain't my first battle. I defeated depression. I overcame worry. Anxiety is in my past. Cancer didn't take me out. They walked out of my life, but I still kept my mind. This battle is going to to see the same thing as those last battles and you've got to understand you're not just fighting for yourself he wants to use you to win a battle so your kids never have to fight that giant a day in their life. He wants to use you to fight a battle so that Charlotte doesn't have to deal with it another day of its he's working on using you it's not easy, but it's real. It's not just about us. So I want to use you in a great way. Church is 400 people for three years. I tried everything I could do to quit, and I, God wouldn't. You know, we preach good messages about God opening doors for you. They need to start preaching messages about how God will close the door in your face, lock you in a situation, and say, you ain't getting out. That don't, that don't make a good message. Though. Ain't nobody want to shout off of that. <laughs> and next thing you know, 400 turns to 500. 500, 750. And then revival breaks. Church goes from 750 to 1,500. From 1,500 to 3,000. The pandemic hits. Everybody starts freaking out. I was freaking out. I ain't going to hold you. I was just like, God, it's over. <laughs> God said, you've seen a fight before. Watch me do what I, we came out of the pandemic and doubled the pandemic year when people weren't even coming back to church. Wow. Can I help you out with something? Yeah. What God is doing in Charlotte is supernatural. Yeah. This is a move of God. But this victory is because of some battles that were fought before you got here. This victory was because some people back in Maryland said, we're going to give and we're going to serve and we're going to sacrifice. This victory is because that man didn't give up 22 years ago when this all started. And you may not realize this, but somebody else's victory five years from now is dependent on you not giving up in this moment. You're saying, I don't know if I can take it. You may even be considering taking your life, saying it's not worth it anymore. Well, if you're not going to live for you, live for the people that are counting on you of defeat feeding that giant so that they can live. Somebody else's freedom is dependent on what God is doing. Yes, God is always working on your next blessing, but he's always working on using you in a great way. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 says this, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go tell the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not. God is looking for a believer. That said, God, I'm willing to live a life that's not just about me. God, I'm willing to fight some battles that are not just about me and my last name. But God, I'm willing to be used by you in a great way. You all could come back and play that piano. When the piano plays, I'll stop preaching. If y'all don't start playing, I'm not going to stop preaching. <laughs> Last thing is this, write this down, write this down. God is always working on your next blessing. God is always working on using you. God is always working on drawing you closer to him. 
God is always working on deepening your relationship. Here, here's what Paul prayed. Paul said, my greatest prayer for the church is that your finite brain can comprehend the height and the depth and the width of God's love for you. Paul said, my, do, do you, I'm talking about me. I ain't going to talk about you. I'm, I'm talking about me. Just know I'm talking about you too. <laughs> you could be a Christian for decades and still not comprehend how into you God is. And here you have the enemy over and over and over telling you, well, well, you call yourself a Christian, but you did this. And you did that, and you filled hair, and, you, and just throwing shame and guilt. Some of you, God has forgiven you of things that you haven't forgiven yourself of. And truth be told, that's, I'm going to get in trouble because I know y'all trying to get people on, on Dream Team so you can serve one and worship one. Some of y'all, the reason why you work so hard at church is because you're trying to work off your sin. Here every Sunday, serving every service, just worn out, exhausted, because you don't actually believe that his blood is enough. And that he said, as far as the east is from the west, I have removed every mistake, every sin, every... Your family may not have forgiven you, but God's already forgotten about it. And God is always, I just want to show you my love a little bit more. I just, I just, so here we go, Joseph. Here's his brothers lying to him, saying, Daddy said to forgive us, when they did not. By the way, this was the fulfillment of the dream. They're laying on the ground saying, Joseph, please for I bet back when Joseph was a teenager and he had this dream of his family worship, he didn't think it was going to look like that. He, by the way, I think God doesn't give us all the details to our story because he knows we would tap out if we knew. If we knew, he shows us here and he shows us the promised land. He skips the Red Sea, the desert, the burning bush, the snakes. He ain't going to tell you all that because he ain't going to go on a journey. But here he is at the fulfillment of the dream. Somebody say plot twist. Do you know there is no record in Scripture of Joseph praying during this entire season? Pit, palace, prison. We know that Joseph loved God because he told Potiphar's wife, I can't sleep with you because I don't want to dishonor God. My relationship with God is more important than any. So we know that he had not turned his back on God. But there's no record of him. There's no recorded scripture where Joseph prayed to God during that season. And I could just imagine what Joseph was thinking that entire time. God, you failed me. I'm not going to leave the church, but God, you didn't keep up your end of the word. Some people are in church and they're mad at God. God, you let my loved one die. You said you're a healer. I ain't leaving, but you weren't a healer for me. God, you said you're Jehovah Jireh. That's what they call you. Well, I don't have provision. I ain't leaving the church, but God, you ain't. And I could just imagine Joseph going through these 13 plus, just frustrated. Maybe you're there right now, just frustrated. This is not what life is supposed to look like. He's looking at his brothers and they said, forgive us. And Joseph said, it's whatever. You try to kill me. You meant this for evil. But God intended this. And then it said he began to weep. And as I'm reading this, it struck me. Why was Joseph crying? Here's his brothers at his feet, bowing and lying. And that's not a moment to cry. And then it, it struck me. I think Joseph was weeping because he heard what he said. You intended this for evil, but God in... God did this. I think it dawned on Joseph in this moment. He was with me this entire, I, I thought he had forgotten me. I, I thought he had abandoned me. I, this, whole, this whole time God was working. I think it hit Joseph in this moment that God has never left me nor forsaken me. Even when I didn't see him, he was working for my good. Even when I was angry at him, he was, he, 
God intended this. And I could just see God say, you got it. I just, I wanted you to see me. I could bless you. I can use you. But, but most importantly, I want to be with you. There's a lot of people who want to be blessed by God. There's a lot of people who feel empty inside. And they say, God, use me. There's not a lot of people that say, God, I want to be with you. I don't just want what your hand has to offer, God. I want your heart. Union Church, God is always working on your next blessing. God is always working on using you in a great way. But God is always working on deepening his relationship with you more than it was yesterday. Father God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. God, that you are the ultimate script writer. God, even when it doesn't make sense, even when we can't connect the dots, even when we just seem overwhelmed and like we're drowning by life, God, you're right there in the midst of working it out for our good. God, I pray over every single person under the sound of my voice. God, those that are having the best time ever and those that are on the verge of giving up, that you would let them know you're with them, you're for them. This will work out for their good. Right where you're sitting with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And just give God a moment to make this time, to make this message personal to you. Maybe you're in this room, and if you would be honest, you would say, Pastor, I can't say that I know Jesus the way you're talking about. I can't say that I've ever made Jesus the Lord of your life. Here's what you got to understand. Every story, every circumstance, everything that you've been through has led up to this moment. Because God says more than anything else, I want to be in your life. Maybe you're like me and you grew up in church and you know church. You just don't know the God of the church. Maybe you're new to atmosphere like this and you didn't even know that God wants a relationship with you. Well, he does. And this is your moment to respond to him. I'm not going to have you stand up or come up front. But right where you're sitting, if you say, Pastor, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. I don't want to go another minute by myself. If that's you, can you pray this prayer with me? Matter of fact, every single person, can we pray this together out of encouragement of those that are making the greatest decision and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for seeing me, for knowing me, for loving me. Thank you for shedding your blood, for dying on the cross for my sin, for my mistake. Right now, I surrender. I give you all of me. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.